Please stand. Please kneel. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and with the eternal protection sanctify your servant for whom Christ your Son, by shedding his blood, established the Paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told to see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man whose suffering accustomed to infirmity, one of those for whom people hid their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes, we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shears, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. For he gives his life as an offering for sin. He shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant 
shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to be God. God. From the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 seated for the reading of the Passion. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden, into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. 
So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword in its scabbard. Shall so, I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribute, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Cyprus, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made, because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have also taught in the synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I've spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I've spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of one of those ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, we do not have the right to execute anyone in order that the word of Jesus 
in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a pur purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail. Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priest and the guard saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid, and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you, and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard those, these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. 
Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, the king of the Jews. But that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hesse and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of mirth and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish 
preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord, Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ. Most of you know, I was raised in a small town of Memphis, in the 60s, 70s. And I can say the town of Memphis at that time would be pictured as what you would see on Andy Griffith, Mayberry. We had all these little shops, Becker's Meat Market, Ross's Barber Shop. We had uh, the bank on the corner. The other corner was a hardware store. There was a, another hardware store across the street, a drug store. It was a small town, small town. But every year on Good Friday, From 12 until 3, all the businesses were closed. All the businesses were closed so that those who wanted to could go to their particular church and celebrate the liturgy of Good Friday. It was also a day of strict fast. But between the hours of 12 and 3, you couldn't turn on the radio. TV was just coming into society. You couldn't turn the TV on. And you had to be quiet. You had to be quiet. to reflect upon all that had happened. It was a different day. It was a different day. And you set aside all that would be cumbersome in your life so that you could remain silent to reflect upon what makes this day, what makes these three hours Different, different. The crucifixion of Jesus. There is one thing we fear, and that's silence. We fear silence. We look for any excuse to indeed have activity or movement so as to avoid silence. Silence helps us to center ourselves. It helps us to reflect. And it helps us to understand where God is leading us. It was difficult in the 60s and 70s even more difficult now with cell phones and everything else. We need silence. We need silence. We don't have to have confusion. There's enough confusion in the world. What we need is silence to hear God speak. I have a friend of mine who always has either the radio or the TV on in his house, even when he's sleeping, it's on. His cell phone is right next to him all the time, 24-7. It's always on. And I quit going to dinner with him because 
His telephone calls were more important than the dinner itself or those of us who were at table with him. And so I asked him once, what are you afraid of? That you have to keep the radio on, the TV on, the cell phone right next to you. What are you afraid of? And he said, very simply, I'm afraid that God may ask me to do something. So if I keep myself with the radio and TV, I can't hear God. I can't hear God. As we celebrate this Good Friday, May we indeed appreciate the silence, not only of this day, but the silence that comes into our lives. It's important. It's important to give God a chance to speak to us. We do a good job of speaking to Him. We do a poor job of listening to Him, though. May we listen for the voice of the Lord. And may we indeed respond to God's call in service to the church and in service to the world. But may, may we not fear silence, but may we appreciate the silence of our hearts and of our minds so as to hear what God has in store for us. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guide her and unite her throughout the whole world, and to grant that, leading our lives in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify the Father Almighty. Almighty and ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout all the world may persevere in steadfast faith. In confessing your name, we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for the Most Holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord who chose him for the order of bishops may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's Holy Church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded. Look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, may grow in merits by reason of their faith. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for Archbishop Alan Vigneron, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministry that by the grace, by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts, unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness for all their sins, through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty and ever-living God, who make your church ever faithful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of catechumens that, reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for all brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his holy church. Almighty and ever-living God, who gathers what is scattered and keeps together what is gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith in a unity and bond of charity. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Jewish brothers and sisters who were the first to hear the word of God, that God may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty and ever-living God, who bestowed your promise on Abraham, our father in faith, and his descendants, Graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on a way of salvation. Almighty and ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Jesus that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth. And that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in this world. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty and ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you, and by finding you come to rest, grant we pray that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of the human race. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord.
Let us pray also for those in public office. That our God and Lord may direct our minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty and ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart in the rights of people, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of their people, the assurance of peace, and the freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he, he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, grant to travelers safety to pilgrims return, health to the sick and salvation to the dying. Almighty and ever-living God, comfort the mourners strength of all who toil. May the prayers of those who cry out come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for a swift end to the coronavirus pandemic that affects our world, that God our Father will heal the sick, strengthen those who care for them, and help us all to persevere in faith. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all life, health and healing, look with compassion on our world, brought low by disease. Protect us in the midst of the grave challenges that assail us, and in your fatherly providence, grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those who working to eradicate this scourge. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Behold the wood of the cross, Behold the wood of the cross. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross. Come, let us adore. The veneration of the cross will follow after communion. Please be
at the Savior's command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Grace, ye grant peace in our day, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always freed from sin, safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Behold, Lamb of God, Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Almighty and ever living God, you have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ. Preserve us in the works of mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, 
we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I would indeed invite all you to, people to stay in private prayer. And um, as you venerate the cross, because we are still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, you're not allowed to touch the cross or kiss the cross, but you can make a bow to it and uh, then you're free to leave or go back and spend some time in private prayer. May the abundant blessing, O oh Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy, fe holy faith increased, and everlasting redemption be made secure. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless us, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This Good Friday liturgy is ended. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And we'll Thanks. depart. And we'll depart in silence. <laughs>